Welcome back, and we prepare for PGG versus Gravitas coming up as game number three. Gravitas coming off the high of a game one win. PGG coming off the high of just life, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> of Sully's mustache. Yes. I liked how they zoomed in on his mustache yep. as we're talking about it, and he just starts caressing it. He can't help but touch it. It needs an edit, some seductive elevator music added to it. Content. Nah, it needs a sexy sax man edit. <laughs> it does, it does. It needs something. It probably needs a razor ball than anything else. Uh, all right, so I jump back into the Nick bag. Uh, this question comes in from Sith Cat. I'm moving to Sydney in a few weeks. Can oh, boo! Please, can you please find me a place to live? Uh, oh, jeez. Boo! Where, uh, like, any suggestions? Anyone in the chat got a free room? Are, are we budget conscious or not? I'm sure uh, they are. Um, but let's, well, let's set a budget. Let's say... Well, if your budget's conscious, go to Lidcombe. Right, okay. That's, That's what I'm going to say sport. from my experience, right, is I looked in Central and, like, the neighbouring suburbs, and I was like, this is insane. This is double mm -hmm. what I paid back home in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So then, I was super lucky, obviously, because, like, Tim... And you had to use real money as well, like Australian dollars <laughs> as opposed to New Zealand dollars. Tim obviously threw me a lifeline and put me out in Lidcombe, but, yeah. like, looking at the other places out there, it's pretty reasonably priced, and it's not that much of a mission, so... So the thing about Lidcombe, Good train station, direct yep. lines, yep. under 20 minutes to central. Yeah. Very, very important because Sydney's city is pretty cool. It's yep. pretty handy. Um, also, it is one of the only outer suburbs with really good MBN. So it's MBN is like weather unaffected, 100 up, 100 down. Yeah. Good MBN. Uh, and good Korean barbecue place. That's the, I say place. Yep. Because there's, there's the only, only one. The one place. The only yeah. place. Uh, and yeah. they have a cemetery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's true. Do, yeah. He's hit the nail on the head with that one. He's actually stolen my. Isn't there a TAFE though, right? It is. There's a TAFE yeah. and there's a cemetery opposite side of the so road. make sure you graduate. It's a little bit humbling. You walk out and like, that could be me. So we've agreed they're going to... What, a TAFE student or a dead person? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Honestly, I'd rather be in the cemetery. Uh, uh, so we've agreed they're going to live in Lincoln? I, well, I think the point is, like, a direct area, train line, like yeah. Jake's mentioned, is very important and not in the middle of the city if you're looking at costs. So. Come live near me. It's lovely. Yeah, well, if you have, like, $1.6 million, go live near Nick. Or live in Forest Lodge. Forest Lodge is nice. Because they have the, so like 10 minute walk from uh, where we are in Piermont. Yep. And they have the tram sheds. And tram sheds, food. Yeah. Oh. Forest Lodge is good. Oh. Glebe, Forest Lodge, that yep. whole area. Very Great nice. area. Uh, all right, there you go. Uh, people in chat. Uh, also, so don't live in Sydney. Lothi says my one bedroom is up for rent. Uh, Pacifras says there's a spare room under the bridge. Uh, <laughs> there is. Everyone sleeps under the bridge in uh, New South Wales. You know the bridge that goes through the park? I think it's the highway out to the airport or whatever. Yep. That yeah. Under that bridge, there's like literally tents and stuff set up. It's like a homeless wow. community. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. If we you... used to run around there and do burpees in the Get Fit and Strong Like Rusty Challenge. There's a video out there. Yeah. Is on, there? On my YouTube. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. And Spawn what is getting that? injured yeah. trying to be fit and strong like Rusty. <laughs> and what is that YouTube channel? I don't remember it. We'll, we'll, find, it. we'll find it. We'll find it. We'll put it on the show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This is a happy uh, accident. The next question comes in from Anon. What is the cost slash annoyance ratio for moving out from current housemates? How much must they annoy you to make moving out and all the costs that go with it and the increased rent be worth it? Well, first of all, do it and move in with Sidcat. <laughs> we're, we're matchmaking here on the OPL, which is really ultimately what this show is going to be. I had this actually. I actually moved out of a flat with friends, mind you. I was living with 10 people. It was chaotic, crazy to say the least. Yep. Uh, I was like six to seven months into a 12-month tenancy, pretty standard, and I was just like, my mental health was just shattered, right? You've got so many different groups. It's one thing to like have friends, but to live with them, obviously, very, mm -hmm. very different. Mm -hmm. So many different cliques within that, people having different schedules, different ideas, different work. Um, got to a point where I just wasn't happy, and when you yourself can't be yourself at home especially, that's when you know it's time to go. That's, I mean, we're that was very deep. Very yeah. good advice I was going to say, as soon as you could afford for your lifestyle to be one-third rent, one-third other stuff, one-third savings, yep. you can move out by yourself. Until then, you have to put up with the annoyance. I think as soon as you see a testicle that isn't yours, it's time to leave. Really? Yeah, that was my experience. I live with a couple of guys who just constantly walk, walk around naked, walked into my room naked. I'm like, I can't, I can't live. What is that? Yeah, that's... That's not allowed. No. That's just not allowed. allowed. Um, wow. I, think, I think that the cost-annoyance ratio is an interesting one because while it is very annoying to move and it's very costly, generally when you when you move into a place, I mean, ideally by yourself, but whatever, 
the, nothing compares. As soon as you move out, you can't move back in. Uh, I See, maybe I have very different experiences to everyone and obviously maybe sharing too much. But when I moved out because of annoyance factor, I drove myself into like 40 grand worth of debt. Really? And that was what more crippling doing? than living in Forest Lodge where the place was tiny and $4,300 a month. That's true. Uh, and like we obviously had to get rid of all of that before Jasper came. So that was like a year worth of serious saving. Mm. Uh, and like my tooth broke at the same time and Jenna went to uh, Kenya for a nursing trip. We had a lot of expenses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so like, yeah, but I would say that like your mental health, if you have to put yourself into debt to live by yourself, is going to be way worse. Yeah, don't do that. Well, that's, what, that's what they're asking. They're saying, what's the cost to annoyance ratio? Yeah, but they're not talking about debt. They're talking about the costs that go along with it. It's a little less play money, but a little more, you know, what is play time. There's external factors, right? Like, can you yeah. live back with your parents again? Do Don't you, do that. Do you have another friend that you yeah. can live with? I'm There's just so you, many options. No, annoying how, no matter how annoying There's your so friends are, options. your parents are more annoying. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if not your parents, your auntie and uncles that come over for those damn Sunday lunches are more annoying than anyone. Um, you got possibilities, is what we're saying. Well, there you go. I'm just saying, money isn't everything, but not having money is everything. And honestly, so don't how, put yourself in a bad situation. How annoying are these people? Are they just annoying? Because annoying, you could probably stand, stand uh, yeah, absolutely, up, right? Annoying, just sometimes like, annoying is fun. Don't leave your room. Just like only leave your room when you want to like cook, go to the bathroom, and leave the house. Annoying is fun. Testicles, huh? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, ben White, we only exist because we have to. Why do you continue to exist? Because we have to. No, you don't have to. That's absolutely false. So no, no answers that's like love or my kids. Like why? Like if that's you, not why I exist. If you anyway, you choose to exist. Yeah. Why? Because I'm really intrinsically motivated to like be the best version of me. Because I've been like less good versions of me, mm -hmm. and I don't like that person as much. Mm -hmm. So ever since I turned maybe like 26, like I had like this light bulb moment. And since that point, like self betterment and self improvement and small wins have really been why I get out of bed. Look at you. I'm the dude that like makes his bed and has a cold shower because I like read somewhere that that's good for you. You're like Tony Robbins. I'm all about the small wins, Nick. So small wins are why you keep living. And like, yeah, and I also think like good people. Like we have this rule in the order house, I always meme it, but it's like good people. So like you can't be good at other stuff in your life unless you're a good person. Because mm. eventually some of those bad habits from being a bad person will catch up and make you a crappy League of Legends player, school teacher, librarian, yeah. whatever you are. That so happens to be temporary. Yep. Right? Yeah. EVB says they exist to spite others. <laughs> Well, we also exist that. in part to abuse Twitch chat, that's certain. Oh, yeah. that, wait, that's, uh, a, that's 100%. <laughs> but I think why continue to exist, like, without being as deep as possible is yeah. a, just a big question. Yeah. I think that, like, I exist because I enjoy existing would be the simple answer. I think you exist for gym selfies. <laughs> <laughs> that's a part of my enjoyment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I enjoy going outside and feeling wind on my face, and I can't do that if I'm not existing, so why would I stop existing? There's a part of me... I exist out of curiosity because I look at my parents and laugh how boomer related they can be in terms of IT. Like, oh, can you fix my phone? I'm like, you just need to restart it. Mm -hmm. There's a part of me that is so curious to imagine what am I going to be like when I'm 50? I talk about this all the time. And like, how am I going to be with my own kids? Yeah. And are they going to be coming up to me and be like, can you fix this? I'm like, what is this virtual reality gadget thing? Yeah. I wonder if we're going to be, because we've been brought up with IT and technology, if that's going to be a... No, I think or... you deliberately forget. Because you've got to remember, our parents had some form of technology. Like, when their parents were banging on the TV with a shoe and stuff, our parents were like, oh, you don't do that. You just have to turn it halfway between this channel and this channel and the yeah, picture yeah, will be yeah, clear, yeah. right? So they grew up with some form of technology I, I, yeah, as well. Sure, sure. But I think what actually happens is you get to, like, 45, and you deliberately are like, you know what? I don't care. I'm not going to learn how to use a new phone. <laughs> I'm going to make a punk 16-year-old do it for me. Yeah. And I think it's like a deliberate stance. And it happens around about the same time that you start wearing bintang singlets, short <laughs> hor shorts with holes in them, and like socks with your flip-flops. Yeah, your okay. Thongs. okay. Like, Fair. Like, I think it all happens kind of at the same time, Skippy. I'm curious. And I'm I curious. cannot wait to be that yeah. person. <laughs> That's very funny. I like how you're like, I want to I want to continually improve until I hit this point, and then I want to <laughs> rapidly degenerate. Uh, all right, yes. why do you continue to exist? Let us know in chat. Why uh, do you continue to exist? Uh, uh, like, there's all the dumb, obvious answers like love, but the, um, uh, I'm kind of with Skimmy in terms of curiosity, 
more about human nature than necessarily just like because you get stuff. fascinated. Like we we're talking about coronavirus, which obviously we shouldn't be talking about, but uh, you were saying like what it has taught you is that humans suck at dealing with pandemics. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. about coronavirus at all. It's like a human experiment to you. Now. Yeah, for me, like life is one big social experiment, and all <laughs> of you are just like pawns in my experiment. Uh, and I love seeing how the pawns play out. Uh, I think it is endlessly fascinating. I learn a lot about myself from it uh, and a lot about other people. So I intense curiosity about just like how people will continue to grow is probably the reason. Um, that and pizza. Um, all right, it's time oh, to move on to game. <laughs> three, top, please. Pizza, if I had could eat one thing for the rest of my just life, I'd rather be pasta pizza. To. Pasta um, is way better than pizza. Uh, it's just, I, I just eat Italian. So a pizza is an sandwich. open sandwich. Open sandwiches aren't that good. I thought, don't you live to improve yourself? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, it's time for game number three. It is, uh, that's not it. I was about to say Mountains vs. Cheese. It's PGG versus Gravitas. Oh boy, Gravitas, you can still feel the energy in the building. Uh, there's a tingling. I'm fairly certain they're powering the lights right now. Something I think you have to be these lights. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at the PGG lineup and see. Have they brought the same wonder team as they normally do, Jake? Yeah, they certainly have. It's going to be Biofair through the top lane. Yaxley in the jungle. Get back in the middle lane. Creative Penrose is their bottom lane. And Coach Western Way uh, will be pacing behind them. And uh, coming off a loss yesterday. Yeah, Indeed. they certainly are. I mean, as far as performances go, they've been continuing to perplex me a little bit, Pentinet.gg. And I think it's that propensity to be super slow and behind that irks me a little bit. You know, you've, you've now seen proof in these bottom tier teams that are steadily improving do the opposite. You know, when behind or when wanting to get ahead, be more aggressive, and they've found success doing that. So taking the opposite route always does make me very curious to, to see it play out. Uh, Navuntian in the chat says there's way more variety to a pizza though, so I'm just going to leave that there to trigger Jake as we move <laughs> on to the Gravitas lineup. The pizza of the OPL perhaps. <laughs> there's just so much variety there's so in this roster. so many Rasta. toppings on this thing. <laughs> Rusty, talk, and talk to me about the Gravitas pizza. Unfortunately the toppings haven't changed in this day. It still beats top lane Preyless Jungle Suman mid Massive Akali in his last game today. Puma and Trashley in bot lane with Coach Oma. Uh, what else can we say about Gravitas that we haven't already celebrated uh, this well uh, coach. afternoon already? Well I, coach. I'm going back to it. Like, I actually think that for a bottom... Normally when you look at a bottom three team, it's not only that individually their, team, like, their players don't stand up, it's that they kind of have no idea how to play the game as well. Well, at least years past, mm. right? Whereas I look at this Gravitas lineup and I think, like, they do good stuff on Summoner's Rift. They, like, shift around together. They look cohesive. They look on the same page. But, uh... I think that that's impressive. And it's always been something they're very vocal on. When, yeah. when we've had Omo uh, in for the pre-game interview, you know, his identity, look, this is what we're trying to achieve, this is what we want to do, and it hasn't necessarily always worked, but they've always had an idea, and I think that's um, promising to see, and now the fruits of the labour are starting to come through. Well, there you go, and they are, speaking of looking, they are looking very happy, very excited to get into game number three. It is Gravitas versus PGG, and it's coming up after the Mecha's Jam Select. <laughs> Well, this is a big one. The one that we had originally hyped up to be the game. I hate Leading pizza. into it. Pizza sucks. They My don't have microphones anymore. They can't shut me down. I will not stand for this. It's on broadcast. Uh, production Tell them, pizza I don't want to hear it. <laughs> well, this actually shakes things up a little bit, right? Pennanet.gg, four and seven. Gravitas now three and eight. Oh my goodness, if Gravitas win this game, they're even with PGG. Kind of crazy. Mind equals blown. But it does beg the question now, right? In terms of a sense of resolve from Gravitas, do they have what it takes to utilize that momentum from a massive upset to bring it to Pennanet? Or do they say, well, I'm a little bit happy with that one. Not too sure how to react, how to deal with this newfound success. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Interesting dance coming across. Pantheon being continued. No one wants to play against PGG's Pantheon. However, Set and Horn from the red side. Yumi, Olaf, and 
Echo going to be targeted. Heavy target bans towards Freyless. See whether he gets something like a Lee Sin. Sully would probably like that, as one of his most played champions is the Gragas, and it has a very good matchup into Lee Sin. Elise, however, has a terrible matchup into Gragas. No, Gragas has a terrible matchup into Elise, so good pick for Freyless. Take your mind back to week two, so a month ago. It was Gravitas that did actually get the win when these two teams went head to head, rather convincingly so ooh. as well. That was a kills. Carthus game, wasn't it? Uh, ooh, it wasn't. It no. Wasn't? Sully was playing the Jarvan. Prelus was actually playing the Elise, so Prelus very comfortable with this one. Ah, he it was, was on 20 Jarvan. kills to 8. I thought that was a game where he was uh, Karthus and he was like proxy farming behind their turret, but he must have been Jarvan. Different uh, game. Slightly different game. That was where Puma debuted the vein and showcased yeah. what he could do with it. I do remember that. It's a good matchup into the Jarvan, so it makes a lot of sense. Let's see what they go with in the bottom lane here. They keep flashing the vein to PGG, so a little bit of mental warfare maybe. Trying to tilt them on. a little bit, yeah. I would like to see a Morgana picked up here. I'll explain why if it happens, but it doesn't. Okay. So we'll forget about it for now. Okay. We'll ponder that full. We'll put it on the shelf and uh, consider it a little bit later, but they are going to lock in the Irelia. I can actually talk about it maybe briefly because the Irelia doesn't really add much to the composition. The reason Morgana is really interesting against the current 80 carries is specifically with Kaisa. So the okay. way you have to think about this is Kaisa is the best dueling AD carry. In raw single target output, she's really, really strong. And a lot of the popular AD carries right now are very low mobility. So Misfortune, Aphelios, right? So what they do is they kind of set up in their sphere, they park themselves in mid lane, and they're really hard to ship. But if Kaisa gets the jump on you, if she's able to tag you up, take a black shield into the back line, she'll clean you it's up the in the delivery. one 3 one right? So as soon as the jungle shows on either side, you can be so aggressive on Kaiser. And we kind of saw Dream or Rare or whatever the heck his name is yesterday <laughs> doing that for order. He would just yes. take the black shield and then he would just run at he the Nautilus and just like completely shut down the support. And as Rusty was mentioning, if you can't proc after shop, if you can't get CC down on these carries, then you're really, really squishy. And the same situation is here with Praetith and Rogue if there was uh, Morgana picked up here. So I think that in 1-3-1, one, one, this is kind of an underrated combo. Also very good team fighters, but specifically in that trio of the three in the mid lane, a lot of kill threat with uh, Morgana Kaiser. What are Pentanet considering here for their final ban? Are they on that same wavelength? They're not. They're actually going to ban away the Alistair, which Rogue played last time. Now, a heavy priority from Gravitas to deny away some of the heroes in uh, Biopanther's arsenal. Take it away the Singed, which we've seen once. And yeah, the Morgana. I mean, they obviously wanted this because they banned away the two best melee answers. You're not going to play Rakan into it, which is the other thing <laughs> uh, up and available. Um, and they flash it back. Uh, so like, I mean, they obviously wanted this in Channa. I also am hesitant to have this opinion because okay. I agree with it on some levels and not other. But I think Enchanters scale better than the melee tanks, which sounds really weird. Okay. But Enchanters will do their job really well late game and can play on the back line where they don't, they can get more rotations of utility out. Mm -hmm. Whereas the melee guys are kind of one and done, um, which makes a really interesting dynamic. I think Enchanters at the moment with how, the, how much damage comes out of AD carries, Enchanters do scale a little bit better because they get multiple rounds of spells sure. out. Uh, it's something that LS talks about a lot. Um, and that is going to be a top lane Aurelia into Scion. And let me tell you, this matchup, unplayable for Scion. He does not like this matchup at all, Skimmy. He gets stunned out of his stupid ground slam, so he can't uh, wave clear all that well. And obviously Aurelia is one of the first champions to attack shields. And I think we're going to see Beats go mid lane, and we're going to see Suman go top lane again. They must have a swing creatively planned out for this one. The fact That's that doing. Irelia was already locked in, they've actually picked Scion into it. Well, I think what they said is Human's going to play Irelia and he's going to play mid lane, right? So they've gone with a good Irelia matchup, which is LeBlanc. And then obviously Beats has gone, well, I'm a mid laner as well, so I'm going to take Zoe into the mid lane. Now, this is also a contentious opinion, but I think that Zoe beats LeBlanc. Now, obviously, uh, Western Mike, just over on the table over there. Um, so obviously this is contentious because everyone looks at Faker play LeBlanc and is like, but Faker beat 
UCAL or BDD in this matchup. And I'm like, yeah, but he's Faker and he has like an 87% win rate of LeBlanc of all time. So I think he beats most champions on that. Um, I like Zoe in this matchup. So I think that interesting draft coming out from Gravitas here. I'd like to see how those lane swaps pan on out. Westerway, uh, talk to me first of all a little bit about this Scion pick, the fact that Jake's highlighted here that uh, doesn't have the most fun if the Irelia were to go into it. Are we going to see a heavy priority, I suppose, of Sully's resources up in the top lane? I mean, Brendan is, uh, or Biopanther is a player who's kind of confident in every single matchup. Like, if he's in the worst matchup in the world, he'll just always be like, guys, it's fine, and then somehow he just doesn't really lose it that badly, so... Yeah, he's, he's pretty much confident no matter what he plays. He's also a weak side Titan, isn't he? Him, Swiper, Quaker, they're kind of the three really good tank players left in the OPL in what has kind of become a carry position, potentially. I mean, I think Biopanther is... He's very good on his tanks, but I think he's also very good when he plays carries and stuff, too. He's just a... A role play. He does what's needed for the team, and whether that's playing a carry champion uh, or a tank, and I feel like he plays all of them exceptionally well. Now, talk to me about kind of the composition you've put together as Invade actually coming out right now, so potentially hold the thought. No, it's all he's safe. Talk to me about the composition you've put together. It seems to be pretty good at all stages of the game this time around. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think generally when you get Aphelios, that's kind of the case. Like, uh, I think Aphelios is a very, very good champion. Um, so obviously very happy with the composition. And um, yeah, just like usual, like standard. Uh, Composition, we can play for team fights. we can just, uh, no matter what happens in the game, we can scale and, uh, and do well. Okay, I want to talk about something really quickly, and you can say I don't want to answer it if it is, but that is the lane swap ward coming in. Was the intention with the Scion to maybe take some uh, kind of inspiration from Legacy's lane swap yesterday, or was this always going to be standard lane? I mean, we, we're not talking about the lane swap for this game. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it back to the matchup in particular, so Took on Gravitas in week number two. They were able to take the win there, so obviously seeking vengeance for that. But having seen them take down Legacy today, does that change things? Or, you know, the preparation that you have, that's what we've locked in, that's what we're doing, that's what we're going to go for. Oh, no, definitely. We uh, we don't change anything just because we see a team, you know, win a match just before. Um, you know, if we, we, we just focus on what our plan is at the beginning of the week. We practice our strategy, and then we play that when it comes to OPL day. Beautiful. I look forward to seeing how that evolves on the map here today, uh, Western Way. Best of luck. Thank you very much. And kind of, I've been speaking about this matchup a lot, Skimmy, and mm -hmm. we kind of saw how it's supposed to play out. So, the Zoe's going to play in her way. And what she's going to do is she's going to continually throw Qs out. And if LeBlanc W's forward, she's going to auto attack her with the empowered W, uh, with the empowered auto attack. Then she's going to throw a Q back at where her distort is. And if she doesn't go back to that, that she's just going to keep auto attacking because she takes Aerie and there's such a short travel range. Aerie just starts doing so much damage in this and the empowered auto attacks really do start stacking up. Now, it should also give you lane push at the same time. Problem is, Beats has taken a couple of unfavorable trades, it looks like, so it might be a little bit harder to execute. But I think Beats should have the advantage in not only trading a little bit more efficiently, but also in uh, getting the wave push and really League of Legends nowadays is all about pushing lanes. If you can get pushing lanes, you'll win early game just purely off neutral objectives. Now, talking about losing matchups. Also, this kind of stuff happens, right? Where you walk forward and you grab yourself a heal and then you get all this extra damage and like what a stupid buster champion she is. Sully, however, here in the wings. I was going to highlight top lane there where Seaman was finding advantages with the CS and actually grabbing Kralis to come in there to push that objective that much further, like they did in game number one. Make sure that that sign has no chance to get into this game, but as you say, yeah, beats in the mid lane. Going to command a lot of respect out of Sully to show face and try and get, get back on the score sheet. And now this is another really interesting thing, right? We talk about it a lot, but uh, mages are very hard to die. Because, you know, Black Shield as well as the fact that you're going to have that Dark Binding coming across. So, CC immune. Good CC yourself. And then, you have a lot of damage as they approach the turret. So, even though this looks like it could be set for a bottom lane dive, I would not expect that to come in at this stage. And see, you see they go for some counter jungling. Very well played from Sully. Uh, and the fact that his support has stayed here with him means that they might catch Kralis out here. Double ward goes on down to where Ooh. Blue Buff once was. Double land. Nice little dash away. Mr. Cocoon would surely have landed. But Rogue finding priority in the bot lane. Happy to leave Praetive to his own. Able to resist there. And Praetive is one between this lane. Yeah. Uh, we kind of mentioned it, but Aphelios, uh, fun and interesting champion by all accounts. He's probably the, one of the best laners in the game, and then he is the best scaler. Um, he's also not bad at two items. 
probably why he's first picked banned, actually, because uh, that's every stage of the game that we've just covered, and he's about to kill Puma. He's looking at a lot of damage right now, protected by the minions. Black Shield comes out, but Puma has no resources. Yes, he has the summoners, but no mana and very little on the health pool. And uh, Penina going to look to try and find a win in his bottom lane to get some advantage there. An exchange takes place in mid lane as Paddle Stars go amiss. I'm telling you, this is a, if, this is a good lane matchup right now for uh, Zoe. And uh, she's done a very good job of being able to neutralize this. Get back, should be able to get the wave into turret. Next wave just about to leave the base, so it should be done in time. And Puma needs to be so careful. So many ways for them to actually emit that dark shield from finding any value. The binding goes wild. Okay, so the reason they can't leave this lane right now is it's actually pushing back in PGG's favor. I think that little trade there as Rogue went in actually upset that bounce, uh, balance wave. So they're going to take... Ooh, they're not. I was going to say Trashley can use a little bit of his health to take a good freeze and recall here. Instead, PGG walking into turret range, which is very nice to see, and potentially going to see a recall on the cannon creep wave instead. So all he's waiting around once again, always showing face. Can, as you've said in the past, solo that Drake. So definitely going to find a lot of advantages in this bottom side of the map. Freyless is still sitting topside, assisting this Irelia, which you highlighted in the draft. Double the CS right now. I don't even think he was assisting Aurelia, right? I think he just had a full clear top to bottom and no bottom side cams on because we saw that kind of invade. Uh, and this has really just been PGE's bottom lane getting a huge lead for their entire team. You know, when you have control of bottom side river, it's harder for Beats to be able to trade the way he wants to trade. Obviously, bottom lane's fallen down 5 CS and got a very favorable shop right now. Wave pushing back into PGG, so costing Gravitas even more levels and experience. Uh, and I just think it's also nearly one Sully, his jungle matchup. He's been able to get first dragon and he's in a fantastic spot, so well done uh, to the bottom lane of PGG. While top lane is very winning, it's not really going to be until the turrets break up or until Rift Herald becomes available that they can do anything with this. Double control wards for Gravitas in top river. Zoe's bubbles are so annoying. They really are. Imagine, like, the, the fact that commands. Yeah a spell of cleanse to be chosen. You want that ignite, you want that teleport, but you fully are invested in that lane matchup, even so that you both need Merc Treads. Yeah, I mean, also the fact that itemization probably going to be towards like spell pen because there's no real tank in this game, yeah. apart from uh, Bio Panther. So I like the Merc Treads pickup because it kind of does deny the Oblivion Orb from both Get Back as well as Beats. Um, we'll see what itemization they go for, whether we're going to see you know, straight death cap into Void Staff rushes, whether we see second item Void Staff, which I think is under purchase um, at the moment. See, Preyless does visit bottom lane, and is this actually going to happen? Oh my goodness. Okay, so there used to be a top laner in the OPL. His name was ZZD. ZZZ. And then he went and played for RNG, and he was called Lovers over there. Um, had a couple of games where he started. This was his old thing. Uh, Suman has just gone into Preyless' jungle, and taken second red buff. So he's about to come back to lane, and Bio Panther is about to start fighting an Aurelia that now has a red buff. And red buff now gives you really crazy HP sustain. It was rough before, and it's rougher now. Ultimate comes out instantly as they look for the stunning gauge. Chase on down, Bio in a lot of trouble. Forced to burn that flash. That's an easy first blood. And this man right here on your screen, really impressive on this day. Uh, that's not fair. Uh, that's that's actually kind of gross from Suman. Uh, it pretty much guarantees himself the kill with the red buff. Uh, Preyless is happy to give it over. Now, with the fact that top lane is dead, they should be able to grab themselves this Herald as well. I like what Preyless has done here. If there is a Blast plan available, you can actually do it at the back of the pit as well, so you can repel over if you're going to get caught. Yep. Instead, he has to pull it out. Um, and, oh, he's going to get caught. He I is. think that uh, they should have rotated from mid and top when this was being done. Well, Beats was posturing in mid lane for a while, but very cautious of what Getback's able to achieve when he goes in there blindly. Oh, Sully got it. Sully actually denies it away. The chains get cancelled out as he goes to the repel, flashing out of the Scion stun. Now see him in a bit of uh, a situation where he has no flash from that previous engage. Drowsy from downtown will be enough to prevent the chase on. And that's real lazy League of Legends from Gravitas. If I am Preyless, I am... Probably screaming at my mid laner and my jungle there. Because they had blue buff handoff and top lane dead. That is complete control over your two lanes. Just rotate into jungle and make it so Sully can't face check me. 
Instead, they don't do that. Teleport coming in bottom oh lane. My. That's what you look for in an Aphelios. They weren't finding much love in this bottom lane, and it does force out the teleport to try and get that lane online. Irelia donating the kill across to Puma. They're going to lose top lane turret for that one. That is going to be... Oh, he hasn't got it. Why does he not have Demolish? What else would you take in Tier 1? Shield Bash? He's probably going Shield Bash for a little bit of laning phase. Um, but if that was a Demolish, that turret would have fallen down there. Yep, instead they get 4 plates. That's still good. But uh, we'll only tie up the gold right now. As Human, once again, is 40 CS, a kill and an assist up. Take another look at this one. Q not blocked out by Puma. Will, and he also didn't heal. So definitely killed his AD carry there. Um, uh, his support, sorry. Could have been a one-for-one -one trade, but didn't want it to be, apparently. Creative survives. Up by 10. Another redemption. Beats is a god. Beats is getting them. Beats is looking for that fight right now. He's looking for the all-in potential. As Sully rocks up, he hits the kick, he hits the wave, and he serves through the mid lane. Yeah, I mean, that was a very good save there from Sully because uh, get back was probably in a lot of trouble. Being able to pick up double redemption in laning phase and uh, taking that 1v1. However, very good counter game coming across. And you can see that Freilus has been very much second to the punch this entire game. Yeah. Um, had to start without a leash, and uh, ever since then has kind of been on the back foot. Falling behind in terms of uh, camp clearing, and now in terms of gank assistance, kill participation. So really, this game is all on the back of the Aurelia. Bottom lane is in deep trouble. Uh, <laughs> mid lane, you can see, is starting to go in the LeBlanc's favour. A uh, lot of jungle intervention there. And uh, Aurelia, kind of the last bastion of hope. Their comp still obviously does have a lot of strength behind it, as you've mentioned before, with the black shield that can be utilized with great mobility on all four champions for this roster. Well, Suman at level 11 with a black shield is going to be a nightmare to deal with, right? He's going to be unable to be CC'd and uh, just dancing around everywhere. However, they are going to be very behind on this neutral objective game. Second Drake for Penanep. Starting to find a real hold off okay. this bottom lane. So maybe you're saving Grace here, because that is going to be a Cloud Drake picked up as the last Drake of the game. And Cloud Drake kind of sucks. It's not the best Drake in the game at the moment. Uh, it's not really going to help out Sion. Once he uses his ultimate, he's already going to be in a fight. Maybe helps out Zuli a little bit. Um, and the LeBlanc can use it for duking. Probably helps out Philos a fair bit as well. Typically, you've seen him go into the Sorcery Tree with uh, Nimbus Cloak for the extra movement speed. But once again, it's that man. Sully says hello. And he says goodbye too. Big disrespect there from Beats. I think you have to flash earlier than that. As soon as Sully gets in range with that smite, you know he's looking for the flash kick. Um, so, this mid lane has turned into an absolute nightmare. Mr. Skimmy. We talked about uh, how it would be a nice little matchup for them. Get back says, hold that fault. Going to make this Zoe have a living hell. Honestly, Honestly, I think it's really been Sully that said, hold that thought. I'm going to make this oh, Zoe absolutely. have a living hell because he's a thousand gold up right now in the jungle position. 580 carry. It's really, as I said, 1600 gold for Suman. And it's only going to get higher. He'll take himself a plate here. He's been crushing it in terms of emitting pressure on this map. Braylis just hasn't found a chance to respond. Now, no flash now available on this Aurelia. They are moving up here. If Rogue goes, he might be in some trouble. Rogue doesn't have flash, but he is a step away before the other members of Gravitas can respond. Four members here. Now, they don't spot these other two waiting in the wings. They're going to surely know that something's up because he has no flash. And he can now play a little bit more aggressively. Turret will, in the end, scan things out as Sully rocks on up with the Vision uh, Scry. And you can see that once again, Suman is planning himself up here in the top lane. Pratus knows he's there. That's a very nice deep ward. Don't know how that wasn't communicated, however, Skimmy. And uh, once again, Beats is going to die. Goodbye. Oh, lands a bubble this time. He's got double cleanse right now. Pratus stars starting to hit. Starting to hurt too. 
But the 1k gold difference between these junglers right now starting to show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sulik's had run of the map. He's got himself two dragons. He got himself the first Rift Herald of the game as well, after it was very heavily leashed by Praelis. And uh, Praelis had a terrific Echo game. And really targeting that jungle pool does seem to have worked out for them. They got rid of uh, the Olaf and the Echo. Kind of his two best jungle picks, I would say, so far this season. And top lane turret in dire straits here, looking to fall down. Now when they go for the all-out engage on the Praetor, what kind of CC susceptibility does he have? Well, Rogue has the answers and he's got the sunlight. He lays them down and Praetor follows up flawlessly. It's not even that, that's just miscalculation. When he has these guns, the lifesteal that can come out of Praetor is insane. You saw him hit the Q as well as the ultimate there and got back pretty much half his health. It's going to be a huge shutdown picked up for the AD carrier. This is kind of what Aphelios does for a game. He really warps the game state. Uh, Lifesteal Chakrams, uh, fun times. Yeah. Uh, and I was actually watching, you know, some Team Liquid content. I was like, do you need me to explain what Aphelios does, guys? And his team was kind of like, yeah, we do, because he does like a whole lot of weird stuff. And uh, I think that may be one of those situations where they just didn't take into account the amount of lifesteal he was going to get back. Yeah, especially when he utilizes that uh, Scythe pistol. Pretty disgusting, mostly the mobility it gives you to fire without home to auto step auto. And uh, this game is very nearly over. Uh, they haven't been able to find any semblance of a 1 for 3 1. Uh, mid lane now up 30 CS and a kill. Uh, becoming very difficult to be able to navigate. I'd expect Banshee's Dale to come out second from Beats as well, even though he has gone cleanse. It's just going to be very useful against. The kick against the LeBlanc, even maybe against the Aphelios Q as the game progresses. And they're not in a real situation to be able to defend this dragon either, because they have no control over mid lane or bottom lane priority right now. Um, so we'll see whether they're able to get in a good position. Drake up in 20. Absolutely he does doing? have that Rift Herald, so obviously he can use it to find some pressure, but he's going to be donated some pressure. Or is he? Is it the bait of the century? It may just be. Trash okay. using the stopwatch to draw Sully in. He scratched this and he thought this is free. But the team waiting in the wings come on through. That was bizarre. It's human now, potentially spotted out. But this dragon should go across to Gravitas. And Pajiji maybe make their first big mistake of this game, wandering through that river. Raylus will find a moment to shine as he'll pick up with his team, the first dragon of the game for them. Bayer will continue to farm away down 50 CS. We talk about being a brutal matchup. The kit will still have some viability, but it's going to be an uphill battle. And the viability he has is he's just legitimately one of the beefiest tanks in League of Legends. Uh, we talk about Ornn as the best scaling tank, but that's mainly for what he gives his teammates. Yes. Whereas the likes of Scion, Zach, and Alkai, they're the best tanks because they're just the tankiest tanks. They're like, in they're your the, face. Yeah, they're the best tanks in the truest sense of the word, right? <laughs> then you have kind of the damage hybrid tanks like Poppy, who still has some good utility in a kit, you know, through the W, being able to stop dashes, through the ult, being able to transform land into team fights. But yep. as far as, like, tanky tanks go, Silent Maokai Zach certainly still on top of that list. Well, Penna are angered by that loss of tempo. They had run off the map. They had the dragon in their sights, and they had a rift hole they could have used to bait the members away, to put them on a potential soul point. Not going to find maximum value with it this time. Who they fight here? If you Sion ult the tur turret, it does do damage. He could kill it right now. And the Gravitas are split away as Ooh, the turret is stun. very low. Rose is going to jump in under tower very aggressively, instantly fills that. That is a flash away. Now he's going to be met with a Dark Binding, followed up with a Golden Stopwatch, instantly met with a lot of damage, but he survives with a shield for the meantime. Nobody is dying, the tower stays strong. Multiple summoners used on the side of Gravitas. And Bio is just doing his job flawlessly right now. You can see that he is just standing in front of everyone saying, you can't get through me. And uh, turns out he's correct. And uh, that will be the disengage successful. Still about 2,000 gold lead for Pensanet.gg. Uh, but that fight looked very close. Rogue had to burn his flash to be able to live there. 
Summon the spell check on the flip side. It's going to be Trashly that used his. So support flashes exchanged, but I think some warning signs if you are a Gravitas fan with how little damage Bio Panther just took in that exchange. Great signs though for Praetor, he's the only man on this roster that has a bounty. He's got the kills, he's got the resources, he is after 11 games, 34% of this team's overall damage. He's the one you want to give these resources to, much like Raze on Legacy. And Rogue has gone on a one-man warding journey. He's got two completed items now with the Infinity oh. Edge coming online. Rogue is utilizing that Bruiser style support to great effect, taking very risky paths to get some deep wards down. He probably should have died there. He walked over a ward and they were so slow on the collapse. I think they kind of thought like he's not going to go to this deep solo and kind of didn't move away from their waves, but he went right into the jungle, stuck his nose in their business. Um, so interesting play from the support of pentanet.gg over Vision. Once again, this re-siege mid lane going to resume. And uh, now that they have the numbers here, this is a 4v3 turret will fall down. Turret goes down, and Bio may be just laughing straight to the bank with this counter pick. Down so many CS, but the team are finding wins across the map in other areas. And now it's just about whether Suman can kill get back, right? Because his counter pick has been in a completely different lane the entirety of this mid game. Siege now on in tier two bot, and no response coming across. No lane is positioned properly for Gravitas to actually mount a comeback. They just sacrifice the tower for free. Bio is standing strong in mid lane, and only now top lane comes in. Potentially looking for advantageous shops right now. Maybe they're thinking we need Ginsu's before we can fight. Need second item to be picked up for beats, especially if it is going to be some form of soft penetration coming across, looking for a one shot onto someone like Praetor. But the beautiful rotation between mid and bottom that allowed them to pick up two turrets for one gave them so much vision with all those wards there. Gonna make it very, very risky when this next trade comes up in 45 seconds when Gravitas do go for that initial check. Pennant with their engaged potential able to look for an easy pick. Yeah, honestly, it shouldn't matter too much. Like, the only thing that matters when teleports are down is do you have mid lane priority? And with a Zoe, like, the answer should almost always be yes. Because um, you can just sit here throwing CC. You've got, like, some of the best wave clear in the game from the safest distance. However, they aren't actually challenging for that. They've okay. opted to try and get to River first. Um, which is very interesting to me, Skimmy. Because all they have to do to regain this control is Scion ult through that choke. Scion places a control ward down near Baron Bush. Keeps eyes on that in case Gravitas look to try and force a flip. Go sleepy. Binding does not connect. Kaiser may have been considering that one. The solar flare not going to stun anybody just yet. The black shield going out onto Aurelia. He's drowning. He's dead. Rogue is gone. Now it's off the Freyless who goes for the repel. That's going to be the Moonlight Vigil looking to take out this Aurelia, which he does finally connect with. They say go. They say let's get it. And get back is the one who finds some love in this exchange. If the CC ain't there, if the kills don't come out, Pennant run you down the mid lane. And once again, that is just a huge misunderstanding of the Felios in this composition. He has max sights out for the entirety of it. They don't get onto him, and he just tortures everyone. Meanwhile, Bio Panther, who is still 70 CS down, just stands in front of the whole team and takes no damage. I feel like not correct utilization of getting any flanks here, being able to set up a correct team fight. Instead, they just run head first at the front to back team comp. And Pentanet.gg just make the pay for it. Black Shield was not enough to ensure that the Aurelia was able to get a kill before she fell on down. I mean, before any of this, Beats has to use the flash, right? So you can already see disaster happen. Then look, tanks in the front line. And Praetith with the sniper, as well as those uh, damn annoying shark rooms, is just putting out so much damage from the furthest range. You have to get him off those guns. And if you take a look, he has to swap right here. This is a much better gun set to be able to fight a front-to-back 5v5 in straight-up skirmishes. Obviously, the lifesteal from the daggers is going to do a very good job, but that sniper rival plus shark room combo that we've seen Arguably in the OPL... the best in a situation like oh, that. Honestly, the best. You just put the turret down, you start farming up your sides. Any cues you land... You're untouchable. ...infinite range, and he does disgusting DPS. And uh, that's exactly what we saw. Praetith, by far the MVP of this game so far for 100%. me. 100%. He's had a few moments where he has been online quite early on to this game, but they've been unable to, as a team, 
transition into anything meaningful. But this game, they're starting to set up those win conditions, as you can see now, sitting on three Drakes. Vision now being repositioned towards the Baron. Mid lane, constantly getting pressured in. Constantly putting Gravitas on the back foot. Making it very difficult for them to get Vision down on their own accord. And now maybe we have our first 5v4 in Gravitas' favor. LeBlanc was in the top lane. However, they don't look for anything here, Skimmy. Instead, they're just trying to secure some shallow vision of their own jungle. I feel like this is a completely different Gravitas that we've seen. Game number one, they played fearless on the edge of almost recklessness yeah. in some of those fights. And were able to ultimately pick up the victory. This game, they have looked almost timid from the start. There's been a lot okay. of hesitation in this one. Sully very early on with a kick knockback. Drowsy will land this time. It's and, on to uh, Bio, not the one you want. It was on to Praetor, but Bio just kind of stood in front of him. And now they go for the fight. And he's going Tokyo Drift style, looking for the knockup, but that's the Black Shield that will prevent it. Mark gets applied here by Kaiser, but not a desirable situation to follow things up with now. Pentanek continued their assault on this map. Top lane still being pushed in here by LeBlanc. Bot lane passively being pushed in. They return to mid lane and push it once more. Gravitas not given a window to even ward things up. Yeah, potentially looking for the fight one more time. They do have the Solar Flare available. Flash Solar Flare gets negated beautifully there by Trashley. Plenty of time to respond on that one. Rogue using the stone plate. Very, very tanky as a result. But look at the damage that just comes out of Aphelios at this stage of the game. He's just unrivaled in front of our team fights. You cannot go with this guy. Well, compare the ADC items. I think I know which one I would rather have in my inventory right now. Absolutely, and I mean, once again, Kaiser is a pretty good answer. Once she has ramp up on the Ginsu's, she can fly into the back line. But I feel like this has just been Gravitas not setting up their side lanes well enough, not getting the Isolator 1v1 away from the objective where the teleport for Human would be more impactful than get back having the cleanse. They've had windows in this game throughout where I think they could have played this much more aggressively, Skimmy, but instead they really have just been dancing to the tune that Pentanet have set. And we keep saying it, but Pentanet's a really good slow team. They get upset when other teams play fast around them and they can't kind of react to that. But when it's just been slow versus slow, they've always looked the goods and uh, this game is no different. Prelis. They like to mold the map into whatever their idea is. And that means death if you're their opponent. They find one to start things off with. Aurelia jumps in trying to be a hero, but turns out to be zero. They look for trash. That's the triple kill for the boys. And Penanet from Western Australia will now turn her attention towards the Baron and look to try and close things out. And honestly, there's no way you get a lock in on this Baron. Once again, the perfect guns for a team fight are here. They're going to look for beats. They are indeed. Beats is running. Beats has got the flash at the very last moment. Talk about greed. But still, Baron will fall. There is a 5 1 0 Aphilios on Summoner's Rift who has three completed items as well as that QSS. As we take another look at this, Freilus gets the Dark Shield. I was wondering why it wasn't given to Human when he went in here. Uh, but a good collapse from Sully on the back line. And once again, the damage from Praetor is just going to be huge. As a sniper rifle, every time there is a team fight available, just juggling those guns beautifully. And uh, this game is going to be nigh impossible right now for the Gravitas lineup. 50 CS up in the mid lane for Penanep. 90 CS up for the Sorelia, but just unable to make anything happen since laning phase one and three. And now they have to contest with the idea that Pentanet have Baron, and they're looking at a Cloud Drake Soul. Lanes are being pushed to try and respond, but Getback's already on the right idea by posturing through bottom lane, giving them the ability to go for the 4-1 split. Potentially take out two inhibitors in the assault that's going to take on this base in 30 minutes. And we'll see how they look to repel that assault, right? Because one of the things about playing Aurelia is she doesn't have great wave clear for a side laner. Uh, and I think with Baron buff, it's going to be very hard to force Sion off any of these turrets. You can see already base broken in the first area. Second wave mid being prepped. If they can't get a fight right here, I just don't see how they manufacture I one. mean, Sion's still going to work on towards that tier two turret first and foremost in the mid lane. He's finished it now. They instantly switched their attention after dropping the inhibitor. Mid lane is where we want to go. Gravitas 
resigned to their base. No flanking opportunity available. And I mean, now it's turned into a very meaningful gold lead. They've got themselves the Drakes. They've got themselves, you know, 7,000 gold. They're going to have the two big game aiming objectives in under five minutes spawning as well, Skimmy. And uh, it looks like time really has run out for Gravitas. After how quickly they played against Legacy this morning, you thought maybe there was a hope there for them against PGG. But uh, unfortunately, Preyless without his two real star junglers at this stage. Uh, looked a little bit lost in the early game and the game has been very, very rough. Bio is literally unkillable at this stage of the game. Yep, the item's in his arsenal, and with no armor penetration to try and take it down, he is a walking giant. And it looks like finally Gravitas got the lane deploys that they probably wanted 15 minutes ago, right? And um, they've got themselves Aurelia on the opposite side of the objective, pushing in as fast as she can. Still has a massive goal, uh, CS lead, 100 CS up. But uh, unfortunately, just was not utilized to create any pressure early on in this game. And I think that's been the main difference will now have to come back and help defend this base. Otherwise, they're just going to take everything. Yep, systematically, they're working their way through that base until there's nothing left standing. But your Nexus, but you, inside, dead. Crashly using that stopwatch once again. Zonya's coming in clutch every single time. Oh. Out comes like the Moonlight Vigil. It does a lot of damage, but a lot of it is negated by that Black Shield from Morgana. The third inhibitor falls on down as Winions now become a very real possibility as Pentanet, in their true fashion, keep this game very slow, methodical, and controlled. Yeah, I mean, that was the right decision, right? Praetor flashed forward, was chunked out, and there is no mana left available for Beat, so he's going to struggle to fight here. The rest of Gravitas looks like they want it, but perfect guns for Praetor again. He's back to full health. And uh, I don't think they're going to get a look in. Two super creeps coming up in every way right now. This should end the game. Minions are going to come in now, and they're going to come in from the side lane, so they're white. Gravitas don't really have much to take on the map because those neutrals are down for at least another two minutes. Oh. Puma meeting the wrath of a 2-0 uh, LeBlanc that is so far ahead of their counterpart, Lyrelia. A CC bot at this stage. I mean, if she gets onto the back line, she will still do damage. It's just about whether she can get there. The Winions are doing their job. Now they jump in. Who can they find? Can they get anybody? Pentanet oh. are surviving. Pentanet are living. And Pentanet are killing as Praetor picks up a double. Bro gets in on the action and Praetor finds the triple. He gets the Quadra. In true fashion, Praetor. The Titan of the ADC roll. They take down Gravitas. And they don't look at an upset on their cards today. Yeah, really well played from the Pentanet.gg lineup. Able to get themselves just advantageous team fight after team fight. And peeling that Aurelia looked like no problem at all for Suli and Rogue. Uh, at moments, Gravitas looked like they still had some of that momentum carrying across from the Legacy game, but I think really misunderstanding the win conditions of these comp was definitely not a group and win comp versus the likes of a Felios and a Sion in a team fight. They needed to play that 1-3-1 one, one style a little bit better skimmy, and they just weren't able to find it. Unable to find really any uh, luck with the Aurelia being so far ahead. Prelis unable to really assist those side lanes, resigned to the amount of pressure that Moustache Man himself, Sully in the mid there, able to put on to this game and get, get back online. And then Prelis finishing it with a quadra kill. They've all got their Moustache on now. <laughs> well, GG for them, not a double upset today. Gravitas won't get their 2 0. Let's send it back to the couch to break it down. There you go. Yeah. PGG bringing the goods. Uh, Gravitas unable to uh, make it a bit of a dream evening for themselves. Yeah, I mean, if they got the 2-0, it would have been flabbergasting, right? But they do stand strong, Pentanet.gg. They get the victory that was, you want to say, expected. But mm -hmm. with the trajectory of a lot of teams at the moment and with how hard it can be to predict, especially this week, there's been a lot of surprise yeah, games. Totally. We weren't sure, but we did get the expected result. And part of that expected result was a solid performance, a great performance, in fact, uh, from Praetith. Congratulations on the win. Awesome, thank uh, you. You really just took the wind out of Gravitas' sails. Yeah, I think um, I was having a lot of fun, um, which which was, yeah, it was fun. But 
Normally, normally in games, it's a lot more serious, but that no, felt really fun for me. Did so. it feel like for you in that game? Because this is how it felt as a spectator that Gravitas weren't really familiar with Aphelios. Did you get that <laughs> feeling? Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I'm like one in five on Aphelios, so like one in four, no PL. So they probably they probably sussed that out. But I think uh, no matter what champ, like MF or Aphelios or like Zaya, like. Um, I, I think they, I think they knew what the champ did. It's just once I got accelerated, like those champs just can't do anything. I think if you want to draft against Aphelios, you don't do it that way because, right. uh, like, the red gun just gives me so much value in these fights. So it's just really hard for me to fight. Yeah, it's god mode, right? When you've got the yeah, exactly. the white and red guns. Together. I have like three thousand health, and then the three thousand health shield, and then I hit and I get three thousand health. So I basically have nine thousand health in the fight. Mm. So it's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, is there any is there any discussion going on internally within PGG about like team mustache? Um, Can you grow? Yeah, like there's there's uh, there's discussions, but it's it's not it's like very one sided, like no mustaches, and then <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so the discussion is is solely going, please, yeah. please, guys. Yeah, and then he just I don't know, he doesn't shave it. I don't think he gets it. Can I just say I'm a fan? I'm a fan. I oh, like I like it. it too. Yeah, I like looking next to me and just. Seeing a just feeling like <laughs> it, it, it's I like know, if a, I said the words Tom Selleck, does that mean anything to you? I don't know. Just nod and say yeah. It's just like that. Oh yeah. 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 Like that. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, congratulations <laughs> on the win. If you do decide to grow a mustache, please send me a tweet. Uh, send me a picture of your mustaches, and we'll be back after this break. Herald, so he can use it to find some pressure, but he's going to be donated some pressure, or is he? Is it the bait of the century? It may just be. Solar Flare not going to stun anybody just yet. The Black Shield going out for Aurelia. He's drowning. He's dead. Rogue is gone. Now it's up to Freyless who goes for the Repel. That's going to be the Moonlight Vigil. Looking to take out this Aurelia, which he does finally connect with. They say go. They say let's get it. They like to mold the map into whatever their idea is. And that means death if you're their opponent. They find one to start things off with. Aurelia jumps in trying to be a hero, but turns out to be zero. They look for trash. Less the triple kill for the boys. Winions are doing their job. Now they jump in. Who can they find? Can they get anybody? Pentanet oh. are surviving. Pentanet are living. And Pentanet are killing as Prater picks up a double. Bro gets in on the action and Prater finds the triple. He gets the quadra. In true fashion, Prater. The title of the ADC roll. They take down Gravitas. And they don't look at an upset on their cards today. Feeling the heat? Grab a pineapple or Pineberry Frozen Fanta Mix at Macca's. With 36 flavours, it's the largest range in Australia. Grab one for only $1. A little goes a long way at Macca's.